taste it. Go for it. Ooh! It's, it's beyond. It's gone into the next stage. It's almost turned back into cream. It's not gas. It's Bread. Tar. Yeah. Tar. Mm. Oh, oh, oh. Kind of scary to All right. So it's not going to come out of the tailpipes in back. So, what was the line? Show me. Hi, I'm Jamie. This is Dead Dodge Garage, and this is most of a 1957 Plymouth Belvedere convertible. When I say most, well, I'll assume you know what I mean. There's some stuff missing in this neighborhood. We actually have some of the parts to fix that. More on that in a minute. Most of the Mopars you see on the channel and most of the Mopars we work on here hail from the 1960s and the 1970s. A bodies, B bodies, C bodies, and even Dodge trucks. That's the kind of thing we're usually messing with around here. So many C bodies being reclaimed by the earth right now. It's ridiculous. In spite of all that, here at Rocket Restorations, we do actually have a love and an appreciation for Chrysler products of the 1950s, like this one. Tom found this thing over in like, I want to say Iowa or one of the Dakotas. Who knows? He made the deal on it some time ago and only finally got it picked up on this last trip. In fact, if you paid really close attention to my ramp truck road trip video, there was a clip of this thing in there somewhere. Now you might already be looking at this thing and thinking, ah, Christine. Yeah, pretty close. This is a 57. Christine was a 58. It just so happens we're going to be putting 1958 fenders on it. That's this whole other thing. Apparently the previous owner was also a fan of the 58s, as I've been informed that this cluster is from a 58, as well as the steering column. If there's a difference in the clusters, I truly have no idea what it is. Now, while I do like these cars, I'm not exactly an expert on them. I've owned a 1955 Plymouth. They're uh, a little more boring than these things. No fins. Well, they have little baby fins, but that doesn't count. This car is a member of Chrysler's forward look. They were supposed to be very modern looking, you know, ahead of their time. They kind of were. Kind of. This car is a great example of the funkiness of the forward look era. Virtual Exner's brilliance and strangeness. The fins and the weird angles and lines and all of that. If you know full-size Chrysler cars well, you may be able to point out some interesting bits of DNA. For example, this windshield and vent window shape. Here's that shape again on a 62 Chrysler. And here it is again. This is a 63 or 4 Chrysler. A little harder to tell because all the components are gone, but it would have had roughly that same vent window. And I think that's kind of cool. Even this basic cowl design survived. That's Chrysler Corporation for you. Changing as little as possible because money. So again, I'm not an expert or anything, but I do know something about the original Plymouth Fury. It was an off-white color with a gold side stripe, just like this. The first Fury came in 1956. It continued for the 57 model, and it was only available in that tannish off-white color with gold. So this is interesting to me. It's almost like someone ordered themselves a Fury, but they saved a few bucks by getting a Belvedere. I'm told that Fury convertibles didn't exist in 56. They did exist in 57, but they were definitely rare. I just find that connection really interesting. The Fury was the top Plymouth at that time. In time, like so many other nameplates at Chrysler, the Fury became just another model, a normal pedestrian commuter car. But in the late 50s, it was something special. And even though this really isn't one, I still find that super cool. <laughs> I wonder if Tom noticed all that. Well, that reminds me. These 57 models were well known for rusting. This one's not too bad, at least not back here. The rockers are another story. If you don't know, around this time, there was one Plymouth car. They stuck a few different names on it. For 1955 and the big restyle that made Plymouths, well, kind of cool, they had hotel names. The bottom of the food chain, the cheapest one, was the Plymouth Plaza. That's what my 55 was. Next up from there was the Savoy, and then the Belvedere was the fancy model. And then Fury came along in 56 as the performance alternative at the top of the heap. Those names continued through 58, I believe, and then things got weird again. The Belvedere name stuck around through 1969? Or was it 1970? Somewhere around there. And by that time, Belvedere was the bottom level car. Anyway, if you know me, or you've spent any amount of time watching this channel, you know what I'm most excited about here. 
That would be the fact that there's an engine under the hood. This is a polyhead engine, the Chrysler A-Series engine. You may know some of the history of Chrysler's Hemi engines in the 1950s. I don't really have time to get into all that, but the important detail is that Plymouth never got their own. In 1956, they did get their own V8, but it wasn't a Hemi. It was this, the polyheaded A-Series engine. It was essentially based on a DeSoto Hemi, but with these polyheads on top. The initial A engine size was a 277 cubic inch version. According to the internets, it may have actually been available in late 1955 models. I don't think that's correct. In 1955, Plymouth was using a Dodge Poly. Anyway, for 1957, the basic V8 engine under this hood would have been a 301. This greasy, nasty, disgusting poly engine though, not a 301. As we can read right here, it's actually a 318. Now the 318 size that we all know and love also appeared in 1957. <coughs> I don't know what kind of dust is in this thing, but it's bad. This is a 60s 318 engine. And I know that because of everything about it, basically. It actually gets even more interesting than that though. Cause it turns out this is an original three pedal car. Here's the Z-Bar or bell crank mount where the clutch linkage would have gone. As you can see, it's no longer winning with us. Instead, we've got a 60s push button transmission. So like, figure this is basically 1964 B-Body stuff. Thankfully, they included a push button box to match. I don't know if it's actually attached to anything necessarily. I just found the trim panel though. Neat. We could fix this. And eh, the shifter seems to be stuck. I don't know what gear it's stuck in, but that's not seeming ideal. Mm, also stuck. All right, um, might be running myself over pretty quick here. As usual, we're starting this adventure somewhere in the middle. You can see here the spark plugs are out of the engine. When we first picked this thing up, I could not get it to turn by hand. I grabbed the fan and the belt and reefed on it both directions. Wouldn't move. So we figured it's slightly stuck. Today, we got it unloaded from the trailer, rolled it into the shop, and then for fun, because we can't help ourselves, I went ahead and pulled all the spark plug wires and pulled the plugs out. There is zero rust on any of the ends of the plugs. There's some rust here, but that's fine. It didn't look like moisture actually got into any of the chambers. And the carburetor moved free too, so I took that as a good sign. I took the liberty of doing something I never ever do, and I actually lubricated the bores. I used some kind of like Marvel transmission fluid. I don't know, whatever they handed me, I squirted in there. And then I got brave and grabbed a breaker bar and leaned on this thing just a little bit. And it went dunk and it rolled over 360 degrees twice. That tells me this thing's gonna be a runner, probably. All of that gave Tom at least enough hope to walk 150 feet and grab our one good battery for me. So now I'm gonna hook that up in this thing and see what we've got. As you can see, we're missing some stuff like inner fenders and lighting and what have you. So there's a bunch of wiring that's just not doing anything. And I'm a little concerned that some of it might be like hot. So if I connect this battery, stuff might start melting. We're gonna have to watch for that. You've probably noticed there are a lot of important components missing from this thing. And that includes taillights, for example. So there are even more wires that are probably sitting on the floor of the trunk and might try to catch on fire. We do have bumpers for the car, and we have taillights, and I think we have all the trim, which is awesome. And the convertible top is here. It's ruined, but it's all here, and the uh, mechanism actually moves and everything, so that's good news. Anyway, I'm just gonna hook up these battery cables and hope for the best. If this thing does run, we'll probably just like ratchet strap the battery in position, and then we'll figure out something to do with all this stuff. I'm not worried about it. Okay, so far, so okay. <clears throat> Ooh, bridge handle. Now this may come as a shock. It shocked me, but there's actually a key in here. Let's see if it does anything. It does! The gas gauge moved and the oil light came on. Does the starter crank? No, no it does not, but it was a nice idea. That would probably be the reason for this wire's existence. It's a random wire going to the trigger wire on this solenoid. So let's see if it does stuff. No, no, it doesn't. Oh, that would need to be grounded. All right, hang on. This is all super sketchy. There's the wire that's powering the entire car up right now. That's cool. Um, I'm not having any luck getting this to somewhere where I can hold it to the negative. 
that won't also result in fire. <coughs> Telling you, it's not good. All right, I'm pretty sure that thing is bad. Unfortunately, we don't exactly stockpile those because Mopars don't need them. The way this one's wired in is kind of weird, actually. The trigger wire down on the starter, because of course these starters have their own solenoids built in, is just hot wired to the big post. So maybe I have to undo that and run this wire up here and bypass this thing. Oh wow, this thing has a transmission filter. I did myself a favor and went and grabbed my tool cart. Hopefully it's far enough that way so if this thing is in gear and it takes off, it won't like wreck it. I kind of like this car. One of the things in my tool cart, the power probe. So I did go ahead and check this thing. Electrically, it's fine. So I started beating the crap out of it and now it makes clunky sounds, but no power goes through it. So I'm giving up. I'm gonna rearrange that and make it so it works the normal way. Incidentally, I'm starting this really late and I have to leave like five minutes from now. So it's not exactly gonna run tonight, but the way this is wired now, I haven't fixed the solenoid wire, but there's power going straight to that starter. So if it's good, when I do this, it should crank. There we go. Not sounding too good. Pretty sure this battery's dead. <sighs> well, it could be this, I guess. Or any number of other things. Yeah, that's not enough volts, guy. So I'm gonna put this battery on the charger and head for home. And we'll come back to this in the morning. Oh, I couldn't help myself. Did you know I have like major self-control issues? Anyway. Really? Come on. I need like at least one more hand to do all this. There we go. Okay. Put the plugs back in. Figure out spark. 100 bucks says that's a runner. I shouldn't make that bet yet. I figured out some stuff. <laughs> cool. Sure, why not? Oh. No, don't worry, I got it. I got it, it's fine. It's not, it's not fine. Did you know 57 was the first year for torsion bars? Well, it was. Oh. Oh. Get the tractor. <sighs> Do I have to put it away? Stay. It's the next day and it's nice out. Probably too nice out. It's supposed to be like 83 degrees or something in a bit here. So I'm gonna see if I can make this Plymouth run real fast. I did take the liberty of checking and making sure the engine does in fact still turn over. So now I'm gonna reinstall the spark plugs and go from there. But first, I took another detour through the points. This thing is equipped with the simplest ignition system on planet Earth. Uncle Tony's personal favorite, breaker points. The crazy part is there's actually power coming from the key into the coil. And when I bridge in here with a screwdriver, sparks happen, but opening the points does not make a spark happen. And that tells me that these are just corroded up. So I walked 200 feet again to get a file. I'm gonna scrub that out in there and then we'll see if we get sparks when it turns. Oh yeah, look at that horrible powdery corrosion coming off the points. That's textbook. Okay, I've got the points energized and you can see here if I bridge this, sparks happen. Like so, when I open the points, no sparks happen. Gotta keep filing. Well, this took several sessions screwing with it, but you can now hear, when I crack the points open, it sparks. Oh yeah. Plugs are back in, wires are back on. They might even be in the right places. Let's see what kind of compression we're dealing with. Okay, there's one really weak one and one slightly weak one. I'm not worried. All right, watch your toes. Oh, come on. Talk about anticlimactic. Oh, dear. Oh. Hee hee hee. That is gonna be a runner. But it's still thirsty. Gas, 
installed. Yeah, you better walk away. We need more hands. I just hold that. Huh. Where'd it go? You know how I'm always making fun of Ford for their stupid distributors that rest solid in the blocks? Well, that one is uh, slightly rusted solid in the block. I'm sure this will work eventually. <laughs> Maybe some fire. I'm sure you heard it kind of sort of kick off there once or twice. But that was it, it hasn't done anything since then. I added a ton more fuel. So weird, it didn't just magically run. Anyway, looking at the plug wires, it looks like they're one position off from where the factory would have put them. I'm pretty sure this engine's been rebuilt, judging by the fact that it's orange and it shouldn't be. So maybe they installed the drive off, that's correct. Or maybe someone put all the wires on wrong, I don't really know, but I'm trying to loosen the distributor so I can just test the theory real fast. Still don't know if the wire positions are right or not, but I figured out the problem. It lost continuity through the points again. Look at that nice strong spark. Just have to get these cleaned up to the point that they continue to do stuff, that's all. All right, now it's more consistent. Nice. Hey, it might try to run you over if it runs. Just saying. Noted. All right, um, this is really hard to do. Okay, contact. Oh, come on. No, just, just we're playing with it. Or gasoline, something like that. Oh, it's still sparking. It's a good sign. I should have gotten the starter button. Systems, the timing really has to be close, so they won't even try to start. Did you hear it run? You did. Briefly. <laughs> Very briefly. Don't do this at home. Oh, that's where we're at. It's certainly still sparking. That's for sure. About the start button first. Oh, that's great. That'll make life a lot easier. Probably. I used to carry one in my box, but I think I left it on a car. Oh, that's a lot of smoke. It's a runner. That's all the marble we put down there. Yes, it is. Okay, okay, okay. Fill the bowl, or are we still don't. Still well, it hasn't moved yet. It hasn't it's moved yet, so yeah, run. let's fill the bowl. Screw it. It's a pretty good sounding engine, actually. Still probably pulling varnish from the gas tank. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. I think I did a couple times actually. Woo! Hey, that's hot. Still got a spark. It only wants to kick off on your uh, magic, magic dust, <sighs> spicy gas. Doesn't seem 
to like running on the actual gasoline. Okay. Sounds late. Okay. That still sounds late. Now we're losing the battery again. All right, it made smoke, but it's stubborn. I gotta think about this. Now, one thing I need to do pretty soon here is wire in an ignition resistor. I thought there might be one hiding somewhere or like a resistor wire or something, but it sure seems like this thing's getting a hot spark. I don't really want to melt down the points because then I'll have to change the points. This will prevent that issue by limiting the current that goes to the points. And yes, I made a big video about these stupid things and I slightly explained how they work wrong. They limit current. It's a resistor. That's what they do. All right, I wasn't really thinking when I looked at this the first time. This is the part cable used on the later torque flight. This 57, 58 setup wouldn't have had that. They would have just used a brake on the tail shaft, which means this probably doesn't do anything at all. That's inconvenient. Anyway, I started playing with this. I figured out where everything goes, sort of. And I think I've confirmed that it is, in fact, in neutral. I sprayed the shifter mechanism. The shifter mechanism seems to work. The cable does not want to move. I've got it wiggling, but it won't actually shift. And that will eventually become a problem. For whatever reason, even though it moves up here, this shift cable is like seized down below. It's gonna be really hard to shift this thing without that. See on the cable shift transmission, that cable goes inside. There's no lever out here. I couldn't even like reach down there and actuate a shifter of any kind if I wanted to. You know, the fact that the cables melted to pieces could be related. Oh wait. Now that's the park cable. Uh, I don't know, it's all kind of bad news. At least for now it's in neutral, I think, so I probably won't get run over. <sighs> I know this will come as a shock, but the needle and seat are bad. But now that there's gas everywhere again. <laughs> I don't understand why it's so stubborn. It'll fire on ether, no problem. <laughs> sounding engine. I am shocked. I thought the needle and seat may have fixed themselves magically. No such luck. Seems to work for a process. Overflow the carburetor. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. All right. For the throttle. <laughs> He's not super scared of loud cars anymore. That's the good news. Don't eat that. What is wrong with you? I might be taking things a little out of order here, but I think there's at least a passing chance I could have brakes on this thing. This is a single pop master cylinder, lovingly known as a pump and pray. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Now I have studied this technique extensively. 60% of the time, 
it works every time. I just drop fluid in it and pump it for like five minutes. And often that results in working brakes. This really shouldn't work probably, but it keeps working, so I keep doing it. I happened to notice while I was trying to figure out the push button stuff that this seat is mounted on two by fours. Incredible. I have not been doing this long, but I'm already feeling a little bit of resistance. This might work, except for the obvious fact that the master cylinder's bad. Ah! Good thing this carpet was already in pretty rough shape. Eh, maybe it'll magically reseal itself. No. No, it won't. Ah, <sighs> okay. Gonna have to rob a pump and pray off something, but with that done, we might, yeah, still probably not have brakes. This is just so cool. It does the stuff. The needle and seat are definitely getting better. It takes longer for fuel to start pouring everywhere. So that's something. Remember, this thing was slightly seized yesterday. And today, it does this. But does it do this? It does. Well, kinda. Oh, I probably could have been paying attention to the oil light. It's not making any horrible noises, so I think it's fine. An important note about the early 727, the push button one like this. It actually circulates fluid whether it's in park or neutral. In the later ones, you have to put them in neutral. So, the fluid level has gone down as it pumps fluid around the transmission. Gonna have to dump some in there at some point here. Tom has insisted that I share the random factoid with you that you can actually push start these things too because there's a rear pump as well as a front pump. So just rolling the car in neutral, it makes fluid pressure. Enough that when you drop it in gear, it'll spin up the engine. All right, things are gonna get really goofy now. Cause I'd like to drive this thing. We need a fuel system attached to the car. Obviously, we need to strap the battery down. Arrange these electronic bits so they're not gonna get destroyed or shore down or do anything horrible. And we still need that shifter cable. Brakes would be nice, but I'm not gonna insist on that. We're in kind of a goofy, unique situation with this one though. See, we've got a radiator, but the only thing holding it in place, transmission cooling lines and the radiator hoses. That's not ideal because it wouldn't take much to flop that thing back into the fan. We also have 58 fenders. I think I mentioned that. We'd really like to install those on the car so it looks like a whole car. Unfortunately, we don't have the essential piece here in the middle, the radiator support. It supports the radiator and also mounts the fenders. Thankfully, Tom's a hoarder. And somewhere over here in the pile is a pair of like 1961 Chrysler fenders. Next to them, I found this 1961 radiator support. Now it's not the same. It has a different tray thingy down here. It has a different latch support. It has this extra piece. We don't need any of that stuff. We just need the main radiator support itself. Now, even once we remove all this stuff, it's not an exact fit, but it is close. And I think it's close enough. The really good news here is it's absolutely a rusty turd. So it really doesn't matter what I do. Ah, oh, I know I said this already. It is not the same, but it might be the same enough. This is the latch support out of the trunk of the car and well, the top bolt holes almost line up. All right, couple things. For some reason, someone brutalized this cross member before. So the radiator's running into these little raised areas above the strut rods. I'm gonna have to beat those down with a hammer. So the radiator can go this way, and then this thing should end up roughly where it needs to be, which I think is here. I don't know. We could throw the fenders on to line all that up. Yeah, there. You can see right where it needs to be. It's only like an inch and a half further back. This would be so much easier to mock up if there wasn't already a radiator in the way. On these full frame cars, there's actually a mount here with what would have been a rubber isolator or something that the later cars don't use. And so this metal right here is in the way. I'm gonna have to slightly trim it down here. It's a good look. Well, it's a look. No, I don't wanna talk about the new scratches on the door. The good news is they were next to old scratches. The even better news is because this panel has the structural integrity of like a stick of butter, I was able to modify it without ever getting a cutting tool. Dude, I think it works. It's lined up with the bolts at the back. Hood line looks straight-ish. I'm not saying I'm like a genius or anything, but yeah, good move, I, I think. Still need to like try and bolt it together. Anyway, before I get too excited and put that fender in the way, I need to do the shift cable thing. Here's what the shift cable looks like, not in a car. This one actually moves, so that's a good sign. I have no idea if it's the right length, but I don't think the one in there is the right length. It's just run through a random hole in the firewall, so. We're gonna make this work. The shift cable is retained by one bolt. The bolt goes through the adjustment wheel that sits on the collar of the cable here. 
This one is buried in grime. You can't even see it. I just jammed the socket in the dirt. That did her. Let's see if this pukes fluid everywhere. That'll be fun. Common issue. No, no, it's actually drained. Can't believe it. Well, the universe pumped the brakes. It's not a cable problem. I pulled the cable loose on this thing. The sheath moved out freely. The linkage inside will not move. Now I'm wondering if this is jammed in park, does that keep the shift lever from moving? I don't think it does. I thought all that was handled by the push button mechanism, but I could be wrong. Now the thing is, this car rolls and it has a drive shaft in it. So it's definitely not in park, in park, but I don't know. It's either that or the valve body seized. And that would be really inconvenient. Well, here's where we're at. It's one of those good news, bad news situations. The good news, that engine runs. You heard it, it runs great. It'll actually start with the key, as long as there's a fuel reservoir and a battery attached to the car. It didn't burst into flames or anything. There's a lot of potential here. The bad news, the shift lever in the valve body is locked solid. I had a theory it might be jammed halfway in park, so I actually got the park cable unseized, which was no small feat in and of itself. I was able to engage park, roll the car back and forth, verify it was in park, take it back out of park, and that made no difference. All of that means right now, we do not have any hope of a working transmission. Now I can fix this. All I gotta do is drop that valve body out, fix it, put it back in, you know, or grab one out of a different transmission or grab a different transmission. Those are all things I could do pretty easily. Well, I say easily, but not here, not in the driveway in front of the back shop. I need it on the lift. If it was on the lift, we would just be dropping the transmission pan right now. No problem. Not that I want to do this, but I did have half a mind to pull the cable back and spray half a can of magic stuff in there to see if that would do anything, which I don't really think it would. Then of course that magic stuff would be mixing with the transmission fluid and that would not be good. The silver lining here is I'm pretty sure this is going to work. It's very close anyway. With some modification, we could have a hood that works, and fenders that are secured, and then we could see about installing the 58 grill, which would just be fantastic. But I wasn't done with the bad news because while I was looking at the transmission, I started scrutinizing things. I had noticed that this firewall is like tweaked and buckled and goobered up. So I was already assuming that the reason the front clip is gone is because this car was in a wreck. Unfortunately, I kind of noticed some other stuff too. Eagle-eyed viewers may be able to tell from right here, the frame is buckled right there. But it gets worse. This frame horn is off a different car and it's welded on right there, all the way around. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen, but it's not great. The way I noticed all that was by eyeballing the steering linkage here. I noticed that it's kicked rearward that way. That seemed kind of odd, but I thought, eh, maybe it's normal. I mean, what the heck do I know about 57 Plymouths? Well, I know that it's not like that on the other side. And then I kept looking and I noticed how far back this bump stop is and that this lower ball joint is behind the top one, which is totally wrong. They should at least be like straight up and down. And then Tom noticed how badly the strut rod is bent. Pretty badly. They do have that curve on the end, you know, that's fine, but the straight section should run this way and on the other side, it's like this. So while this would probably be fine for yard driving and such, not ready to be a highway cruiser. We need a few suspension components to fix all that. It smells like gas for some reason. All right, well, the good news is that radiator sport's way too wide. Yeah, I know, it's not really good news. Anyway, the fender's on, we scratched the door more, it doesn't fit right, everything's going great. But it does kinda almost look like a car. If you step back here and squint, yeah, the radiator support doesn't fit at all. We're going to try and find a correct one eventually. And I guess we'll put it on the lift and fix the transmission. And I'm sure that'll happen immediately. It is better. No one can say it isn't. Anyway, we're going to put you back in the shop now for the next forever. I'm sure you'll see this thing again eventually. Until then, as ever, thanks for watching. And remember... Well, just don't wait too long.
was. Oh, good times. <laughs> Just a little fire. Oh yeah, next time we do more Fury stuff.